good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. And welcome to another edition of This Month in Long-Term Care Planning. That's our series of webinars uh, taking on a holistic view of all things long-term care planning. My name is Steve Kane, and I'm a director at LTCI Partners, and I lead our sales and business development efforts nationally. Uh, if you join us on these before, you know that these discussions are candid, right? They're, they're not product pitches. They're not commercials for LTCI partners, although we're pretty awesome. Um, our goal is to have meaningful conversations and share insights that you can use today in your business. You know, stuff that you can tactically use um, in your businesses today. So just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. As you know, this is not an operator assisted call. So we encourage you to ask questions by typing them into the question box on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, we're going to spend about 30 minutes with our guests and then stay on afterwards to answer those questions. If we don't get to them, we'll get to them via email or we'll pick up the phone and call you afterwards. Um, also, if you have to leave a bit early, we get it. We're all busy. We record these discussions and you can find a library of past webinars and replays and presentations uh, on our website at ltcipartners.com. Also, um, if we reference some statistics, uh, some resources, some tools, and you want them, um, email us at sales at ltcipartners.com and we'll get them to you after this discussion or give us a call at 877-949-4582. All right, let's get to it. You registered, right? You saw like multiple emails coming to you. You know why we're here, right? We're, we're talking about life and long-term care planning in underserved markets with two good friends of mine and industry leaders. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the guests. I'm not going to read their whole entire resumes. It would take us the 30 minutes. I'm going to keep it brief, and you'll see in no time that these guys are dynamic speakers and that they're experts in, in what they do. The first is Mike James. Uh, Mike is, is our boss, head of individual solutions and president of NFP Life Solutions. And he is responsible for um, all things wealth management, life insurance, annuities, and long-term care at NFP. Um, Mike has been in the financial services industry for many, many years, serves on numerous boards. And instead of me doing this, Mike, I want to know uh, real briefly how you got into the business, how, what led you up to being at NFP, and, um, and also tell us something non-business related that we don't know about you. <laughs> thanks, Steve. Yeah. LZ, good to see you, my friend. Um, and, and thanks for everybody that's, that's tuned in. Um, so... Real simply, it's a very deliberate model that brought me into the business, which I'll probably speak on throughout this call. I got into a diversity internship program back in 1991, which was the portal to to change in my life. I, you know, I, I wanted to go to high, on to college and I wanted to learn uh, and kind of enter the legal field. And I thought I wanted to be an attorney, and but. That internship changed my life. It was with a major insurer called John Hancock in the city of Boston. And they had one initiative with reaching out to young individuals that looked like me. They knew we were going on to higher education and there was this um, scarcity of mm -hmm. Boston-based talent that would go to schools in and around and outside of the, the, the city and never come back. And so they wanted to retain us in the city inside of their uh, insurance company and boy they did such a great job they surrounded us with mentors and lots of framework but the one guarantee is that if you went through the program you'd get full-time employment and to me that was bigger than a pot of gold given from where I've come from so again I could go on and on and on and I want to save some for the rest of the call but that's how I got here all right non-business tell us something we don't know about you man I you know you can't see this on my face, but I have a 17 pound cockapoo that is <laughs> like the light in my life. <laughs> You'll never know that. I, 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 you know, I'm married, I have children, I, I, I live in Boston, I, I, lots of great things, but um, that 17 pound cockapoo kind of, you know, wakes me up and puts me to bed. Love it, love it. Um, Elzia Thiku is a lead application engineer essentially heads up our technology efforts at LTCI Partners and also part of NFP. Um, you know, crazy background in terms of technology. Elzia, tell us a little bit about yourself and again, something fun. Sure. Um, well, I got my foray and I'm going to definitely date myself here. 
I got my foray into technology by working on the first four launchings of the space shuttle. Um, and uh, so that really dates me. Um, but it was it was happenstance that I got there. I got fired from one job erroneously, which was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. Right. And I wound up there. Uh, and then my foray into financial services, after I left uh, Computer Science Corporation at NASA, I went back to my alma mater and was a assistant professor in computer science department and JP Morgan came recruiting my students. And so oh, wow. I took a faculty internship during the summer to go to JP Morgan and do some corporate training. And the next year they came back and uh, offered me a full-time position. Now I was only about 27 uh -huh. and they said, we're going to double your salary. We're going to do this, that, and the other. I said, where do I sign? And so <laughs> I, I signed immediately. I, I'm I was curious. off to New York and I spent 13 years with mentioned... JP Morgan and wound up overseas working with AXA Insurance Company in Australia. So I've been around a bit in the financial industry on the back side, computer side, but it's been a wealth of knowledge and I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Hey, I'm, I'm curious, MJ mentioned um, like a diversity recruiting program at John Hancock, the JP Morgan and the financial services back in the day when you were there, was that going on? Did you see that? Yes, it was. And I was a part of it uh, tangentially in some ways, but I would go out and help recruit at the historical black universities and, and look for ways to help people get mentors, which was something that was very rare back then. Right. It was kind of successful, not really successful, but but there was an attempt, and that's that's what I did uh, while I was there. That's great. So so tell us about that. I know you're a proud alum of Florida A and M, and you're doing a, a webinar tomorrow about historically black universities. Yes, um, and you know one of the key things about historical black universities, especially in the South, I'm originally from Florida, I would be considered a legacy, right? My grandmother or the person who served as my grandmother which was my great aunt who raised my mother she was a graduate of fam c she was born in 1896 then my wow. mother went back to school at 32 and finished i went and finished at famu and then my oldest daughter graduated from famu so that whole thing transpires because there is a support system and a way of being acknowledged and pushed forward so that you yeah. can take leadership positions no matter what you, you do. Know what? I, I'm going to come back to that because I, I think it's not enough to, to get people of color into these organizations or universities. What are we doing or what do we have to do while we're there, right, to help us become successful? MJ, I'm going to come back to you for something. Be can I know you're candid, right? I know you're going to tell the right. truth, right? So right. the insurance and financial services industry, you've been in it forever. If we were to give them a grade, like an A through F grade, what would it be today? F, F minus. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's not that bad. It's not yeah. that bad. But but I'll tell you what, you know, you, you got to widen the lens if you want to really have this conversation. You know, I think the insurance industry and financial services in general is very diverse. I think there's diversity all through the businesses that make up financial services. The issue is there are no names on the door. They don't own the, the, the assets, the building. They're not in control and, in, and mostly in, in executive leadership positions. And to me, that's the opportunity. It isn't that we don't have the intelligence, the acumen, the, the passion to be in those roles, but Again, I think you have to widen your lens and you've got to look back. This country has had a rich history that's been on display for everybody to read and watch and know. 2020 allowed us to sit still, even though it was a horrific you know, visual while we sat still and watched some of the social and racial unrest. But what it did for me, and I think what it did for a lot of people, is it caused them to educate themselves. You know, yeah. what is so deeply rooted that everyone believes that there's systemic racial bias throughout this country? Well, if you go all the way back, you'll understand why. You'll understand why those strings are still being pulled forward and we've got to work to cut them. And right. so, you know, there's a lot to unpack there with my comments, but the reality is 
I'm involved with so many incredible programs right now that are deliberately bringing young black and brown and underserved communities into portals that are not just bringing them into the business, but they're supporting them and their professional <laughs> development so that right. they reach their full potential. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna dig into those in a minute, but Elzia, um, you and I were talking pre-webinar today about the why, right? I, I don't think it's a, a, it's it's a different webinar that we're having today, but it's certainly not a risk, but we have a great, um, a great number of registrations and RSVPs, but you know, LZ and I were talking before this about like, hey, why would a, 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 a white guy that's a financial advisor, um, you know, focused on people that look like him. Not that not that he doesn't have a diverse uh, uh, lineup of clients, but why would they even attend a webinar like this or care, Elzia? Well, you know, quite frankly, I, I and and I just happened to be googling and found this information. In 2021, the black spending power was 1.6 trillion dollars which should say there is a market there and there's a need there because as, as, as MJ was saying, when you look at the disparities that were brought about in 2020 uh, with, the, with, the, with the virus and everything and the healthcare issues, blacks were premier in being underserved or most affected. Yeah. And so when you have that kind of spending power, the ability to put people in a better place for themselves, for healthcare and their family's longevity I mean, it should be an easy sell. Yeah. So MJ, we know what what the financial services world looks like today in terms of the advisor makeup. Is it possible for an advisor that's not black or brown to work in those communities? Yeah, of course. You know, I, look, we work we work side by side, professionally and in society, with people that don't look like us. Um, you know, I have advisors in my own life that look like me, and some that don't. You know. I think, um, but I will tell you that as you get into deeply rooted communities, you're subject to their experiences and their views. And if, if they've had a systemic problem in their local community for a period of time that involved people that don't look like them, then the chances of working with them are gonna be really, really slim. And if you go around our country, there's lots of examples where people have felt like whole communities were done wrong. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not here to harp on the past. I'm here to just say those are the things that shape perceptions in society today. The only thing that's going to change them is if we, we actually have a way to address it. So if you have communities that only have people that don't look like them, that are trying to serve them things they need, but there are barriers because they've been done wrong, nothing's going to change. Yeah. So if you can bring and cultivate, you know, masses of people that are diverse in nature, you give the whole industry a chance to prosper and grow um, because you can take those barriers down. Yeah. I'm going to stick with you on for one, MJ. We're in the yeah. midst of this huge uh, demographic shift where America will soon be a majority minority company. You're a leader of multiple businesses. How does that impact your business? You know, I, again, I'm excited about it. Here's why. You know, I know, and, and this isn't an arrogant statement, although some may think it is. I know when I'm in a room with people that don't look like me, that room got better. Not because I'm the smartest person coming into the room, but because I give them another perspective. I've come through a journey that's different than most. And that has shaped every decision, the way I see things and how I process things. Well, if I'm in a room with people that do it differently, but, but are accepting of me, we just got better. But we just got more versatile. We just got more powerful in executing on what we're working on. So to me, I think that is the benefit. Here's the other benefit. I think if so if, if the U.S. is turning into a minority majority, then the, the, the very people that our profession is going to serve will want to deal with people that look like them. 
that have perspectives that align, that match up morally and socially. And that's okay. You know, that's not bad. That's okay. But that doesn't mean that white professionals, male or female, aren't valuable, necessary, and essential. I actually think if society shifts, then we all see the value of working together and it gives us a better chance to break down some of those systemic walls that have hampered us for decades, for centuries. Right. So Elzia, let, let's say one of our, our clients and friends watching this webinar um, actively goes out and recruits into black and brown communities and they find somebody with experience or without experience and they have bring them into their organization. What do they need to do to ensure these people are successful and feel included and, and feel supported? Well, I think one of the first things that should happen, if they, especially if they're looking for them to move up the executive ladder, is they need a mentor. They need somebody to show them the ropes, so to speak, because they're, they're it, you know, as MJ was saying, one thing that I always say to some of my friends is that as an African-American, I've had to live in an African-American world and a white world. Most whites only had to live in a white world. So I'm, I'm ambidextrous, if you will. I can move <laughs> back and forth between the two environments and, yeah. and, 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 you know, operate. But when I get solely in one world that I've only had certain perceptions of, I need someone to show me where the trap doors are or whether, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to take the rough side of the mountain all the time. Give me some easy up the mountain. And that's number one. Number two would be give them meaningful assignments. Don't give them assignments just to be make do or make easy. Or if you're doing a presentation, don't put them as the person who puts the slides together, but they don't ever say anything or do the research, but never say right. anything. Right. You know, two questions, two follow-up questions to that. Um, number one, MJ, does the mentor have to be a person of color or could it be somebody who's not who's an executive at that company i got both man. i got all flavors that will that okay. will treat me right and and help me out i i got all flavors i i think as a young person coming into this business i think the impact of having a black or african-american mentor was really important and i yeah. had two i had a male and a female and that shaped so much about who I am today. But my journey didn't end there, it just got started. So along the way, people that crossed my path that really, that I asked questions to, that were intrigued by my questions and wanted to know, you know, what my aspirations and thoughts and feelings were, and I shared them and they got more intrigued. You know, every aspect of my life, I had somebody that gave me enough time that it helped shape yeah. my journey. And right. when I was in high school, I had a host family, they were white. I was bused. I was a part of a very deliberate program called the METCO program that bused me to a suburban community for high school. I had a host family for, with, from my teammates. It was my teammates' family on the basketball team that hosted me. And every night at dinner, they asked me questions. I asked them questions. Right. They met my parents, they asked them questions, we asked them questions, you know, it shaped me. When I got into, you know, the workforce as, an, as a diversity intern, same thing happened. I had people, white and black, that were willing to lend a hand, and I got to ask questions, and they got to answer them, and they got intrigued by my answers, and I got to put more questions to them. It just, it, it is, to me, the mentor role is the most understated and undervalued role in the profession. Yeah. That's the role that should be hung out on a pedestal in mm -hmm. every office because that's the role that gives people the confidence that they believe they can grow and they can achieve. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you just from a, my personal experience with a mentor where it made me want to be a mentor to somebody else given the, the kind of stewardship and leadership that I received. That's it. Um, you know, I was reading something this morning, Elzia, and, and you brought it up. I want to touch on it about the, the potential, all this diversity and inclusion. One of the risks is tokenism. And so what guidance can you give to the listeners or the, the attendees about how not to avoid, you know, people being further excluded by feeling like a, a token in the conversation? 
Yeah, and 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 I think the conversation you were just having, you know, I thought about it as you guys were talking about a mentor. There is no business worth its salt that does not have a succession plan. And mentorship is a succession plan. Amen. It is setting people up to take over that entity, that entrepreneurship, whatever it is, to make it successful and keep providing the services, the job that it needs. And so Amen. when you put someone in a token position, just to say, I have someone that checks the box, you don't really get the benefit of it. I mean, it looks good, but it's not going to hold water. So by having a true mentorship program, taking them to certain kinds of meetings, and 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 taking them to meetings where they're going to feel uncomfortable, yeah. where you you put them on the spot to say something, and they're going to say, I don't want to say nothing in here. Um, <laughs> but you have to, because right. that's how you get the acumen. That's how you get the business acumen. And, you know, never judge by a book by its cover. When I was at, at NASA, a guy came back in the room where I was, and he was walking around. And literally, this guy looked like the average farmer. And I paid no attention to it. And he saw me doing my work and he came up and said, hey, I want to show you something. And I'm like, who? I didn't know who he was. Turns out this was one of the design engineers who designed the darn computers to track the telemetry on the space shuttle. Now, if I had judged him by his cover, I would have blew him off. <laughs> but he was a mentor for me from that point on. Wow. There you go. Um, Mike, I want to get, I want to dive into insurance for a minute. Um, yep. You know, as an industry, it seems, in my opinion, that we're not creating the right types of product or distribution to serve all markets. I've always felt like we do a really good job as an industry in terms of market penetration, selling insurance to rich people. You know, what about downstream? Do you feel like there's a set of products and solutions that we need? Yeah, I, so here's, look, my next job, is gonna be the most lucrative job I ever had because life insurance or insurance products don't discriminate. Everyone can own one, buy one, and have one, all flavors. The issue we have is advisors are taught to grow and prosper. So the larger a sale, the more you make. Right. So naturally they go up market. Yeah. Down market, they end up getting they have access to the same products, but they don't have access to the professionals that sell the product. So we have to flip the script. We have to make it as important as it is to help wealthy individuals protect their wealth and transfer it to the next generation. And we have to work with creating wealth in underserved communities so they have the same opportunity, which they have. What they don't have is the time and attention that you get at the upper end of the market. No one would argue, black, white, or indifferent, any advisor that has access to the affluent or ultra high net worth community, they, they get excited by nature, but they don't get excited to go sell a $500, $1,000 term policy. But right. the impact in the communities where those $500, $1,000, $2,000 policies will have on that community, that family, and multiple generations, probably exponentially more valuable to society. You know, I'm, so, I'm thinking about a former customer of ours that that plays in kind of the, the mass middle marketplace, and there's a few organizations that, that do that. But Mike, are there any organizations out there today that you think are driving real change, not just the distribution of product, but in terms of the programs, the initiatives that are that are taking place right now. Absolutely. Well, I'm involved in uh, in in two right now. Um, I think the the Center for Economic Empowerment and Equality stood up at the American College is going to do in amazing things. I think it's going to start with the Black community, but it will migrate to other underserved communities, Latinx, Latino, Asian you know, rural, white, whatever, you know, whatever, what have you, but they're building framework that can be placed across multiple communities. The other is a coalition that I, I'm involved with, uh, that NFP is involved with, that's powered by Nationwide called FAIR. And the FAIR coalition is starting with a program, a deliberate portal to train, educate, and hire 
students from HBCUs. We just did our first webinar last week to over 200 students. I'm telling you, I'm not a graduate of HBCUs. And, and let, let me tell you, HBCU grads are so proud. I was like, listen, y'all going to turn off all this HBCU stuff. I'm still yeah. black and I got something to say. So just <laughs> relax. But uh, anyhow, it was it was awesome because the very reason HBCUs were put in place is because they didn't have parity or the access to go into you know schools that weren't dedicated to black people. So I, I'm, I'm proud of, to, to know that that lineage is still going on today and is and has become a centerpiece as one of the focus areas in our society to bring professionals into our business. And so we're going to we're going to start early. We're going to touch them at school. We're going to work with them. We're going to mentor them. We're going to share knowledge and education. And we've gotten several major institutions on board to do that. Um, and I'm thankful for Nationwide's leadership in that area. Um, Christy Rodriguez kind of heads the program for Nationwide, and she's been phenomenal. And, and she brought the depth and strength and the power of nationwide with her, believe me. So I, I it, and that's just, those are just two things. And the American College is also working with HBCUs. They're standing up curriculums and certifications that allow education on our profession to start while they're in school. That's the yeah. other issue. There's no curriculum on getting into the insurance industry. Right. And there's very little unless you're willing to go all the way to the top and become a CFP, there's very little in the middle. So they're filling that gap with a financial education program that helps level the playing field as early as possible in an individual's life. And they're starting with HBCUs. And I'm excited about that. So it's not just about Black people, but it is about Black people. And so whatever we're standing up in that community, is going to be scalable and leverageable in other communities. So I'm looking forward to that. And last point, yeah. this is not work where we're gonna see thousands of black people all of a sudden come into our profession yeah. tomorrow. I was gonna this ask you that. decades long yeah. work that we're starting right now. So that, that's, that's what I was gonna ask you in, in, in terms yeah. of like uh, the pace okay. of change. Like, you know, I was gonna ask one last question you know, the pace of change, like what's realistic? Is it is it um, seeing more black and brown faces distributing product? Is it, you know, seeing more uh, black and brown people buying product? And, and um, you know, what do you look for as benchmarks in terms of success? Well, LZ, I'm a, I'm a shoot here and you should shoot too. But I, I okay. look, I am, uh, we're gonna measure success on multiple levels. I'm a first generation college grad um but all three of my kids are go are college grads or on their way to becoming college grads and two are one's got their masters the others in a master's program but all did an internship and all were motivated by my wife and i to reach and they've got examples that that show them that that's possible and i think if in the end, I provide mentorship to people that don't have those examples so that they know it's possible. So I think that, you know, to bring this full circle, I think that we, you know, we're on the cusp of doing so much right now. And, but again, it's decades long work. This, yeah. this is not, you know, you're going to see programs funded by organizations that never touched this end of the marketplace before. You're going to see, businesses coming in to our, our profession to help us know how to educate and bring people along that have never been in it before. You're going to see legislation enacted to help give energy to all these strategies. I just think you got you to give it a little time. It's coming. Yeah. yeah. What about you, LZ? Just to wrap this thing up, what, what gives you hope? Well, I'll tell you what gives me hope is one thing Mike said about the internships. But another thing coupled with that is when we have people come in with internships, we can show them different aspects of the business. It's like I talked to my son, my son played football, my grandson played football at a high level, and he didn't, he thought he was going pro, he didn't. But I told him, I said, dude, you might not be going pro, but there's coaches, there's trainers, there's managers, there's GMs. 
There's right. all these other positions if you love the sport to stay involved. Well, it's the same thing in our industry. There are a whole host, actuaries, brokers, advisors. There's so many different places where people can plug in that fit who they are. Mm -hmm. And we just have to let them know because in a lot of underserved communities, they only know the, the salesman who comes to collect the money. That's uh, right. And that's all they know. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Hey, hey, Steve, that's let me say this. Because yes. I want to go back to my first comment. So for people that were on the line, they <laughs> say the industry gets an F minus. Let me make sure I clarify that. I was just being, you know, having a little fun. We don't get an F minus, but we still have lots of room to grow. Yes. I yes. think, um, and that's okay. I think when you have room to grow, you have room to become something special, to, mm -hmm. to build lasting foundational programs that will help a broad swath of people. And I think that's the insurance industry and financial services opportunity right now is our true potential has not been felt because we have not had the access for people from underserved communities that should be in place, that's going to be in place. Right. And so guys, that's I to, you know, I was taking down notes as you guys were talking. And again, I'm a, you know, tactically, our, our, our listeners are, are after this call, we want them to use some of this stuff. <laughs> Two things I wrote down, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is number one, mentor the people that you have with you. And, and no, not in specific numerical order, but mentor, uh, recruit from these underserved communities and promote from within if you have these people in, in your organization. Um, anything I'm missing that, that our, our folks should go out there and do today? You go ahead, Elsie. Well, I would think, I would think, you know, they just need to stay open because one thing I think all of us have said is that the more people you bring at the table with a different preview of life, they're always going to bring another service, another market, another way of solving a problem because they're used to looking at it and they have developed a certain skills that are not always transversed between everyone. So by bringing in people from different perspectives, that's going to always give you a more 360 degrees, which I can handle the problem better. Awesome. Guys, I, I want to thank you for your time today. I mean, when when all of the attendees can stay, I'm not gonna, I'm not I can keep going. But we advertise this thing for a half hour. But I want you guys, to, I want you guys to stay on and and answer some questions. I, I really appreciate the the time that you spent with us, the knowledge that you've dropped on us, um, folks. We do these the third Thursday of each month um, uh, at one Central, two Eastern. Um, if you want some of the resources that we talked about ltcipartners.com or sales at ltcipartners.com. Uh, thank you for everybody's time today. All right, let's look at some of the questions. I got a comment first, MJ. Uh, yeah. They love your artwork. They oh love man, listen, listen. Can I tell the story? Please. So listen, you know, I I can't see everybody that's tuning into this call, but I had a big birthday, you know, for me last year. I turned 50, and so I got licensed to kind of buy something for myself every month. I guess I had license or approval. <laughs> I, I didn't want to put it. I, I bought something for myself every month last year. And right out the outset in January, I, you know, I had some older furniture in my home office. And I said, you know, I, I, you know, 2020 reshaped us all. And so I spent a lot of time reading, reflecting, watching things, being a part of, you know, trying to recognize the significance of where we were in 2020 and, and how I was going to let, you know, lend my own journey to helping people navigate it. And I just wanted, you know, there are leaders that everybody knows. Um, and they could easily say that Barack, Martin, you know, um, Mandela and Muhammad are all people that everyone knows. But I started to really dig into their, the journeys that don't make it in documentaries and headlines and things. and. And those four individuals just just did it for me. And so these are really big. If I back up, <laughs> yeah. you see you see how big these are in my office. Yeah. And I just wanted that at at you know around me every day. I just wanted to be reminded I'm not perfect, but striving to do the right thing for the right reasons is, is still okay. So yeah, that's how those got up. I love it. I love it. Elzia. Um, is there something that that um, our clients should be reading if they want to learn more about working in these underserved markets? Is there something that um, they should go and educate themselves on? Well, you know, 
it was a book that now this is an old book and some of us may have read it before but there's this book how to win friends and influence people by okay. dale Carnegie. Awesome. yeah old book but it is it it basically talks about building relationships and that's what we're talking about here how uh -huh. do you build relationships to keep people engaged and to learn from each other and to be able to be interconnected in a support network that will never be broken if it's done right. Yeah, I, I got some questions about, um, you know, how can I, um, the person asking the question that's not black or brown, you know, work in these communities. And, and I just want to start with like going back to a classic, um, Stephen Covey's fifth rule, seek to understand before being understood. Yeah. You know, it's easy, it's easy for us to, go out there and say, you should, you should buy this product. It's great. I promise you it's great. Here's how it works. That's, that's easy, right? Uh, the hard part is, is investing and in understanding the community that you want to work in. And, and, uh, and I, I think for that question, I'll let you guys answer it too. Um, I, I think you have to study the communities that you want to be in and, and connect with them um, organically, not just about business first, and then it leads to business. Mike or yeah, LZ? I, oh, LZ, you go ahead, bud. Well, I, I'll just give an anecdote that my, my father uh, always gave me. He said, if you really want to know somebody, you eat with them, you sleep with them, and you travel with them. If you can do those things, you're going to know a whole lot about that person. <laughs> and, and so it, in that same kind of vein, if we can have that kind of acumen when we begin to think in business terms and social terms, I'm going to know you. I'm going to know your weak spot, your strong spot. I'm not going to ask you to do something that you're going to fail at. I'm going to try to grow you in that area and then, you know, let you shine where you shine. And I think yep. that's a that's a cornerstone for any kind of relationship, especially now. Yeah, I agree. Mike. I would say, you know, it's OK to partner up. I partner up every day. Yeah. yeah. I'm partnering up with you right now, Steve. And it's got nothing yeah. to do with me being black, me being white or you know, it just has nothing to do with it. It just it's 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 what it is. And for me, I think partnering up is going to become Vogue. I, I think. You know, I my journey has been nothing but partnerships. They continue to be. I mentor people in our company. I partner up with them every day. They don't look like me. They're opposite sex in a lot of situations, and that's okay. And I think going into communities that that perception might put you at a disadvantage initially until people get to know you, I think the buddy system there's nothing better than the buddy system to do it. Awesome. Let me look through the uh, the questions, see if we got any more. A lot of compliments, fellas. So uh, <laughs> we all learned today. And and, uh, and and while you look in there, Steve, you know, one thing a coach used to always say to me, yeah. he used to say, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. There um, it is. <laughs> and, and so <laughs> that's what we have. We have to be ready for these opportunities. <laughs> that's that yeah. HBCU thing coming out again. I know. Uh, I know. Uh, you're lucky his virtual background wasn't his, his uh, fraternity stuff and he wasn't step dancing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is so proud. I, I hear you. I, I see you, man. I know. I know. No, look, guys, that, that's uh, more just compliments than questions. Again, I want to thank you for your friendship, uh, for the partnership here today. And yeah. uh, we'll see everybody uh, next month. Mike, one last thing. Steve, one I got story. one for you. I, uh, you know, Elsie gave a, a book. I, I, I want to encourage everybody to Google a documentary that Will Smith did called Amend, mm. uh, A-M-E-N-D, yeah. Amend. It was, it was powerful because it, it, it was, he was referencing moments in time in history with some of the most influential historical figures in the world, let alone in the United States. But he gave it from a perspective that I don't think most people ended up, um, or, or have heard before. And I think it was it was really powerful. I think it takes a couple days to watch it or whatever, or it's two part, two right. or three parts or whatever. I can't totally remember, but every part of that documentary and that perspective that he gave, he moderated it, he narrated it. Yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah. And, and I think it was really built for everyone to watch and it was really palatable, but it was still powerful and direct at the same time. So I would encourage people to, to take a watch. I know this is like, this is me, not not any anybody else's question. Um, off topic of financial services, underserved markets. I've got two daughters. What do you think we should be doing in our schools uh, teaching about diversity and inclusion? 
So I'll, I'll take a shot at it. I, I think, um, again, I'm a little biased because I was in a deliberate program to help integrate and educate uh, people that look like me in other communities. And, and it was a, an amazing benefit to me because I, I, my senses were stretched and opened and my heart became more welcoming to people that didn't look like me because I recognized that they were a lot like me on the inside. They, they hurt, they, they celebrated, they were curious, they were scared at the same things that I was. And so there wasn't much that separated us. Um, so that would be kind of my, my, you know, my first commentary on it. Yeah, yeah. And I would say, you know, um, you know, because both my my two younger kids, they grew up in pretty much all white environment. Um, and and one thing I always try to stress to them is to always be open and honest. Yeah. As best you can, because that's going to create good dialogue. You may get mad, they may get mad. But the only way you're going to really get to see things differently is have true dialogue. Yeah, and right. and they were able to come up, do well, uh, and and I'm so proud of them. And I know it was a lot of pressure, yeah. but you know, as they say, pressure makes diamonds. And so yeah. I, um, but that's uh, what we look at. What gives me hope um, is that we're having this conversation today. Yeah. You know, because I've been with a, a few organizations that we haven't had these types of conversations and you know, I appreciate you guys. Also, another thing that gives me hopes is I, I've got, as I mentioned, two daughters and, um, you know, we're in a, a mixed family. My wife's Colombian and um, all of their friends. Now I live in LA, there's diversity here in the city, but it seems like everybody that they know is of mixed race. Yeah. And so maybe it's just a timing thing that we get through <laughs> some of these issues, right? There's some excitement yeah. out there with mixing, you know? <laughs> that, yeah, right. yeah. I think that's so, all right. <laughs> yeah. I would I would say your daughters are, you know, I, I think they're they're blessed in this sense. They get the, the perspectives of both of you right at the outset. And, yeah. and and Steve, you know how valuable that is. And I think, you know, you and your wife have to balance the exposure and the access to the things that you know yeah. that both of you bring to the table. But that's the benefit that those girls get. And I I think, you know. I like to celebrate that stuff. I, you know, I have a, a niece that is in an interracial marriage. I have a brother that's in an interracial marriage. Um, and, and I think that's great. I think it has helped our family grow and expand and be more and more accepting of what's different is not very much that different. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. All right, everybody, we appreciate your time. Thanks again, guys. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs> All, right. All right. Awesome.